NFL VP of officiating, Dean Blandino, first year on the job. First of all, congratulations on the new job, and uh, welcome to the program. How are you doing, Dean? Doing very well. Thanks a lot, Mike. So now that you're the VP of officiating, you're in charge of the budget and what uh, the size of the shirts for Ed Hockley is. <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you order for him every year? We Ed is Ed is issued standard officiating apparel, and uh, just like our other our other officials, what he does with it at that point is up to is up to him. But uh, he, you know, that, you, that's we've all seen Ed out there. You know, are Ed, you su- Ed keeps in shape. Are you suggesting that he shrinks his his uh, issued I, shirt? I don't know. I've, I've, there's rumors that fly around, but uh, I'm not. I'm not privy to uh, to uh, everything that goes on in the in the in the Hockley household. So. so, so your existence this year, now that you're the VP of officiating, give us an idea of what your Sunday will be like at the league headquarters on uh, Park Avenue. Sure. So Sunday we'll spend the day here in our command center. We've got. Uh, we've got every game, so we'll have uh, game monitors. So we'll have people that are monitoring each individual game. They're look they're looking for certain situations, whether it's a, an officiating decision, a replay review, a player safety issue. I'll be here in the in the command center, monitoring everything, just overseeing everything, listening into the broadcast, making sure that the the announcers are giving the right information, and we kind of have a a two way communication with the with the networks. Uh, they can call us, ask us for clarifications, and if we recognize something, I can I can reach out and and be proactive and call them and, and let them know um, the clarification or or uh, any information that they may need. I want to focus on the new rules this year, and the biggest change relates to the manner in which players can use their helmets. Dean, explain to us what is now prohibited and also add to that what is permitted when it comes to using the helmet. Yeah, so so this is the new rule. It involves it, it involves contact between runners and tacklers outside the tackle box. So um, we're talking about an area, the tackle box is tackle to tackle. It extends three yards beyond the line of scrimmage and all the way back to the offensive end line. So this rule applies outside that area. It's prohibiting forcible contact with the crown of the helmet um, outside the tackle box. So three components to the rule. You have to line up your opponent lower your head, and then deliver a forcible blow with the crown of the helmet. And the crown is the, is the top of the helmet. Just picture a circle at the very top of the helmet. That's the crown. And so it doesn't prohibit incidental helmet-to-helmet contact, contact that occurs in the normal process of making a legal tackle. It's really this, this narrow, specific three components that, will, that have to be present in order for it to be a, a foul. And one of the biggest misconceptions is that the face mask area, the top of the helmet can't be used. The front of the helmet can be used. The face mask can be used. You just can't essentially use the helmet as a battering ram, dip it down, and use the very top of the helmet. Correct, correct. So the, it, it, like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't prohibit all helmet contact. And so we're trying to encourage the players to keep their head up when possible, to lead with the shoulder. So that face mask contact, even that forehead hairline, which is just above the face mask, that's not prohibited. It's really your, your traditional spear where, where the head is lowered, and that's where the the potential for injury not on not just on the player that's being hit, but the but the player that's delivering the blow, he's susceptible to injury when he puts himself in that position. What do you tell the players to get this to stick? How do they change their behavior, their instincts, the way they've been playing all these years? I think it's I think it comes down to educating them. Okay, well, here's the rule. Here's the technique we're trying to get out of the game, and then coaching it. And I think coaches coaches don't teach the technique to lower the head, and and I think our competition committee felt that by putting this rule in, it will encourage them to coach against it and to and to say, okay, you've got to lead with the shoulder. You've got to you've got to be head up. There's always going to be instinct. There's always going to be that that bang bang play where the player just reacts. But this rule is really designed for out in space when there isn't there isn't a lot of bodies in, in the way. And, and really, it's just that continually drilling it from a from a teaching standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, and uh, and getting it across to the players that that this technique we don't want in the game. And and they've demonstrated. Our players have demonstrated whenever there's a new player safety rule, they've demonstrated the ability to adjust. Talking to Dean Blandino, the new NFL VP of officials, first year in that position, long time with the NFL. One of the changes this year that there's been some huffing and puffing about from the players, the mandatory leg pads, the thigh pads, and the knee pads. A lot of complaints about it. 
But we've had a full weekend of preseason action now. Any issues, any problems, any violators of that new rule? No, we, you know, there, there's been a lot of talk about it, and I think the players have, have gotten the message that thigh and, and knee pads are, are required. And there's, there's always going to be a little bit of, well, well, it has to be covered by the uniform, and our uniform inspectors are, are going to be out there at pregame and making sure the players are in, um, are in compliance with the rule. And so there really hasn't been a lot of, uh, a lot of issues there. It's been cleaned up in the pregame, and we haven't had an issue where we've had to remove a player from the game for, a, for a, an equipment violation. How does somebody become a uniform inspector? It's a, it's a great question. A, a, a uniform inspector, they're, they're former players. Um, so you obviously want someone that's played the game that, that, that is familiar with the uniform. And uh, our, our game operations department went out when, when this first was put in place and, and in the local areas and looked for former players that uh, – would be good candidates to that had a, whether it was an association with the team or, or lived in the local area. So really, former players that 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 we canvassed the area and got to uh, to do this, and they they have a relationship with the team. They understand because they played the game what goes what goes into it. And that's really that's really the process of how we found these guys. A rule change that kind of came out of nowhere last week, and this was a statement issued and an explanation from spokesman Brian McCarthy. The idea that. These convoluted spaghetti strainer face masks will now be prohibited absent medical clearance. What's the reason for not allowing the players to have these intricate, ornate face masks that ostensibly would provide them greater protection? Well, I think that's I think that's still debatable whether it provides them better protection. Um, the I think there's a couple of concerns. Certainly, when players are injured and the ability to see the player's eyes, um, when you have these intricate face masks and the ability for the for the medical staff um, to see in the player's eyes and 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 make a determination whatever they're gonna whatever the the issue is. I think that's part of it. I think it's the the helmet as the technology has gotten better and better. I think players feel more empowered and to use their head, and that's part of what we're trying to get out of the game. So I think we're still looking at that and uh, at that issue of what what is a what is a standard face mask, what should be allowed, and I think that's an, it's going to be an ongoing process. But right now they've they've got to get that medical clearance um, in order to use these these intricate face masks. Is it still permissible to go with the old Joe Theismann one bar face mask if a guy wanted to do that? If he wanted to do that, yeah. There's there's there's. Uh, and I don't know if we still have any kickers that are doing that, but they they still could. It's just not. Uh, I think that the game has evolved to where that that's that doesn't provide reasonable protection to wear that single bar face mask. And, and even though it shows a certain amount of courage and bravery to expose your face, it just looks kind of soft. Can you just can you like pass a memo or something that outlaws that? <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll we'll see if we if you know the macho a macho more macho face mask will uh, will consider that. Tuck rule is finally gone. About twelve years too late, in the opinion of Raiders fans. Why did it take so long for the rule to go away? I think I think it was just the evolution of replay. The the rule that was put in place years and years and years ago, well before that that Patriot Raider play, was was based on the ability to officiate the play. It was it was a bright line. The pass starts with the hand coming forward with control, and it ends when it, the ball is tucked all the way back to the body. So before we had replay, the referee could, could officiate that. Once the hand started forward, hey, it was a pass until he actually brought it all the way back. Now with, with the ability to review these plays, and especially last year when we made the, the turnover, the, the fumble recovered by an opponent, an automatic replay review upstairs, uh, the committee felt that the need for the bright line wasn't necessary and it wasn't uh we could review these plays make the determination as to when the tuck actually began versus when it when it ended and uh and that that was really the the impetus for the change and i think when you look at those plays when the quarterback is no longer his own hand is no longer going forward and he's bringing it back toward his body i think common sense would dictate that 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 is that should be a fumble and i think that's that's where they eventually got to well, great stuff, Dean. Congratulations on the new position. We wish you all the best going forward. Look forward to talking as the 2013 season unfolds, and uh, hopefully we'll be talking soon. All right, Mike. Appreciate the time. Dean Blandino, NFL VP of Officiating.